Um, my first computer, when I was about eight years old, in 1982, this had 16K of RAM, and it was pretty awful, to be honest with you. I mean, the, the stuff that you guys are growing up with, I'm quite envious of. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, but I've been working with in, in IT for about 20 years, almost 20 years. Um, what I, what I would like to start with the boring bit. The, first, the, the important part to start off with when we're talking about sec security, in that <clears throat> IT is very complex. We have layers on layers on layers. It's a complex system. All complex systems contain flaws. These flaws can be vulnerable, and these vulnerabilities can then be exploited to make the system do something it wasn't intended to do. And that's the basis of all hacking, of all of these attempts to try and compromise systems, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that with some examples coming up. I think the key thing is, um, you know, this is becoming a, a, a headline issue. Every day there's a new story about a new breach, a new cyber attack, a new hacking attempt. Just today we've heard that North Korea has been linked with the attack on Sony that happened in the past few days. We've got some great examples, uh, and it's, it's, it's an everyday occurrence, okay? And I'm going to give some more specific examples that you might know. This is all pretty much from the public domain, uh, so I'm not giving away any secrets. Um, but the, the first key one I want to share with you is a, a breach called Aurora. And this happened in 2009. This was allegedly uh, the PLA, the Chinese government, the Chinese army, attacking um, around 32 high-tech companies in the US, the aim of which was to steal intellectual property and to compromise their systems. Now, I used to work for a company that was targeted and I re remember the day that we all had to change our password and all of the security policies were changed overnight. And this was very successful. They used these really complex attacks with multiple stages to them uh, and, the, and the, the whole aim was, was to steal intellectual pro property. And this was really the first well-known nation-state sponsored attack that used these types of techniques. Then we have the famous Stuxnet, which you, you guys may have heard of. If you haven't, this was an incredibly sophisticated attack on the industrial control systems in nuclear processing in Iran. And essentially what the bad guys did, or the bad guys, the attackers did, um, was they, uh, they were able to use four zero-day exploits. Now a zero-day exploit is an exploit that the industry doesn't know about. It's a secret, it's a skeleton key that can unlock something without any, anyone knowing how it works. And if these, you know, you only figure out how, how to block these things after the zero day is discovered, okay? So they used four unknown exploits to compromise this system. They were attacking some really sophisticated equipment. In fact, it was the equipment that was used uh, to control the centrifuges that, that were doing the enrichment of the nuclear fuel. And what it did is it subtly changed it so the yield was too low. Now the guys who were working it in Iran, they were thinking, well, I'm doing everything right. Why is the yield so low? The machine says it's fine. They kept getting fired. New guys were coming in. The same problems were happening. This was going on for years before it was discovered. And this was allegedly, I think it's been accepted now that this was Israel and the US working on this against Iran. But this was incredible technology. A nation state against another nation state using cyber, using malware as the delivery. <laughs> and then we have another amazing example, Target. So this was a breach at the end of last year, very, very well publicised. A few of the key facts, though, they were f the, ba the bad guys in this case infiltrated the Target network and were able to put uh, malware on the P POS systems, the point of sale systems, the thing that you run your credit card through. During the period that they were uh, compromised, just over three weeks, I think it was, the bad guys stole 40 million credit card details. 70 million customer records were stolen. Um, and this led to, after it was being discovered, it led to, you know, the cost to replace the credit cards alone was 200 million US dollars. That's a lot of money. Um, there was a 46% drop that quarter in profits than the year before, which again is huge considering it was Christmas as well, the biggest quarter. It led to the resignation of, you know, two board members. Um, and I've since learned that only 5% of the stolen cards were actually resold for an average price of around $20. That's still four million bucks for the bad guys. That's pretty good. That's a good, a good haul, I think. Um, another example. I love this one particularly. I, I'm a bit, a bit of a, a geek, a very technical background originally, so I'm, I'm allowed to have a favorite ma malware attack, and I think this is mine. The reason why is because after the first stage, because these things are split into multiple stages, after the first stage, the, the code that was on the 
the, the, the user system that was compromised went out and used Twitter to get the next bits of the attack. So in this case, we have Twitter. You can't read it, so I'll read it for you. It knew to look at these specific users, and it says, uh, the weather is good today, it's sunny, and underneath there's some what looks like rubbish, but it's actually an encoded, an encrypted uh, URL, which points to this blue thing at the back is just a dump of a, of a valid GIF image. It's a valid image, it looks fine, but actually that's a piece of the jigsaw puzzle that you reassemble on the endpoint to make the full attack. Um, and it's incredibly hard to detect these things. Another example, I was involved with this one in 2012, it's now public knowledge, one of the largest port operators in the world, 55 million containers a year they, they process, 50 locations. We saw targeted malware attacks uh, with fake emails coming from the local IT manager with his sig signature intact, perfect Dutch. Please, you must install this latest security patch because we're under attack to certain individuals. Obviously, they did what they were told because the email looked real. They double-clicked on it. They installed the software. Um, and actually, what this malware was doing is it was taking screenshots of the internal application that was used to manage the containers. So the contents of the container, the location of the container in the yard, and also the PIN number that the truck driver uses when he comes to collect it. So what they were doing is they were calling their friends. This was going to Eastern Europe somewhere. They were calling their friends with, with the truck who were turning up to site using the PIN number, which they pr provided, and the, the container was automatically being loaded onto their truck and they were driving away. So this is you know, real-world theft from a malware attack, which is a, an amazing thing for me. Um, and then it was so successful that they actually used, it came out from um, look, the intelligence a the agencies and law enforcement that this was also being used to smuggle drugs in through the port because they knew where in the customs process this was. I think two tonnes of cocaine and heroin have been seized. There have been uh, 15 arrests, firearms, firearms seized, and a load of cash as well. So real theft from a, a, a malware attack. And you guys are a target as well. It's not just the, the organisations of the companies. I mean, Facebook has had their problems, their challenges with, with uh, exposing da user data. Um, and Snapchat also, and this is just two examples of many, that your information is also an asset for the bad guys to target. It's not just the, you know, the intellectual property of, of company X, it's, it's us, it's our, our individual uh, information. <clears throat> so there's a company called Mandiant that's quite famous for um, incident response. So they're the guys that are often called for the really high profile breaches when somebody's hacked and they find out. And from there, um, the da their data, and this was a paper that was released, you can't quite see there's a source down the bottom there, um, the mean average, or the, the average number from breach to detection, so the average time that the bad guys were on the network undiscovered was just over seven months, 229 days, average. There are some examples of up to eight years where the bad guys have been running around freely on, on the, the networks undetected. Once they are discovered, and this is of the people who discovered they were breached, it takes an average of 32 days to clean up, to fix it, to, to reinstall systems, to get extra data. And that's an expensive period, an expensive process. I think even more amazing than that is two-thirds of the companies found out that they were breached from an external source. That would be law enforcement, that would be intelligence agencies, tapping them on the sh sh shoulder and saying, guys, you've got to watch over here, look here, over here, this is serious. And all of them had up-to-date security. They spent millions on antivirus and files and all this stuff because you know the, the legacy industry uses signatures if we've seen it before then we know it's bad we can block it it's hard for me to attack a thousand companies because it'll be recognized but it's easy for me to attack one company because I can use a targeted attack and that's really key so there was a, a report done by another company called the Magino Line report and this was they interviewed 1,200 organizations, the investigations there, uh, you know, across the whole globe geographically, North America, Europe, and so on, and across all industries, so chemical, financial, mining, and the rest. And they found 97% of the organizations were already compromised, already breached by the bad guys. The bad guys were already in. And 27% of those attacks 
were consistent with what we call APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, which is a targeted attack as part of a longer term campaign against a, an industry or an organization. Somebody wants what they have and will stop at nothing to get it. So this is pretty scary if you think about the, the consequences of this, the implications of this. Almost everybody is already compromised. And it depends on the motivation of the guys who are in, who are, who are the bad guys to understand how bad that could be. Um, if we go back a few slides and we see that the 229 days in target, this, you saw the damage they caused, they were only in the network for about three weeks, less than three weeks. So it, it's incredible. I was lucky enough to go to the, uh, the Black Hat conference in Las Vegas earlier in the year, and the, the, the keynote was given by a guy called Dan Gear, who's fantastic, and he used this quote, which I love, so I'm borrowing it. If we were to score cyber security the way we score soccer, uh, the, the tally would be 462 to 456, 20 minutes into the game. I, the offense is running away with it at the moment, and the defense is really useless. It can't keep up. It's failing. So the conclusion is, from all of this, from my experiences, you will be hacked. You'll, it's inevitable that you will be hacked. If somebody wants to, they can. So you have to assume that's, been, that's occurred already. So what you have to do then is deal with the consequences of that. Um, absolutely key. So, now we have to think about the world's imagined pics. What, what about the future? Given this such a dire situation at the moment, it's like the picture I'm painting, the, the next big thing is the internet of everything. The internet of things, appliances, cars, wearables, medical equipment, you know, you name it, it's going to be extremely cheap to add connectivity to it, and people will. I think I read recently that it would cost as little as a dollar to add, co to, add to the chipset, to add connectivity to, to any item. So, of course, pe people will do that. And um, there's going to be 50 billion connected devices to the internet by 2025. 50 billion. That's everything. So, picture the car of tomorrow. All of the components of the engine are going to be re reporting back to the manufacturer or different ma manufacturers for usage information, for wear and tear information. You're going to have, you know, each tyre valve will use Bluetooth. This actually already occurs to communicate the pressure back. We'll have um, a black box looking at how hard you're braking or accelerating or cornering, going back to your insurer, which may change your premiums. And tell me when it's going to happen that it's actually going to be cheaper to insure a car if you just let the robot drive. Because there's going to be a day when that happens. And it's not that far away, I think, because humans are just too fa fa fallible, right? But in the context of the security issue, this is all a bit scary. What does it mean for cybersecurity? What are the implications of this? And I'm sorry to say that I personally, at least, have absolutely no idea yet. Really, no idea whatsoever. Which I can live with, but it's, it is a bit of a problem. No one really knows yet where it's going to go. There are a few options. So I was doing some searching, and I found, this is the earliest thing from me I found on the internet. And you have to assume that everything you do is permanent. So this was from, you can't see back there, but this was from the 12th of May 1994, so more than 20 years ago. This is the first post I did on the internet, on a news group, well, the content is a bit, it's a bit geeky, let's not worry about that. But the fact is it was very easy for me to find this. It took a minute, right, using Google. So everything that you do, assume that it's still going to be there in 20 years' time. Do you really need to click post or send? You have to think very carefully. Don't use the same password for every site. It seems obvious, and you've heard that before, but please, really, it's important. Are you sure about the app that someone sends you the link to? Are you sure about the email that, or the link, the attachment? Do you really want to click on that? Honestly, are you sure? Just take a minute. You know, I, I often do a lot of research into different groups online, and I have to be anonymous. So I have a number of alternate online identities that I use, which are separate from each other. And I don't see that, you know, a reason why you wouldn't use that technique as well, just to try and insulate your, yourself a little bit as an individual. So finally, the selfie, right? We're going to talk a little bit about, a bit about the selfie. You, we've all seen them, the selfie sticks and everything. I've been known to take a few of them myself. <laughs> and there's, there's another one there. Um, so it's this year, one trillion fo photos will be uploaded online. A trillion, a million, million. A thousand billion, that's a lot of f f f photos. Um, and everyone's doing it. You know, more than 50% of phone users have admit they've done it. It's more pre pre prevalent in the young. Um, 
But here's an interesting one. So in 2010, the NSA and G GCHQ uh, leaked some presentation m materials that were talking about what they called the golden nugget. If they were tracking somebody, um, the perfect scenario was a target uploading a photo of themselves to social media because all of the information they, they could glean from that as a, as, a, as a state. The NSA collecting millions of faces and scanning the web and social media for the, for the you know, using facial recognition technology. So in the future, the machine knows who we are through biometrical features, how we feel through image pro processing of the facial expression, uh, your friends, your colleagues, your life patterns, of course, where we are and with who through geo-tracking, uh, what we look like through three, three, uh, sorry, what the room looks like that we're in through 3D imaging. Uh, it can then predict what we're, where we, we will be next and what we might do. And the key thing here is it can autonomously react because it's a machine. This is the, we have the internet of things, we have machine to, to machine communication as the bulk of the data transfer on the internet. This is going to happen. So there are lots of sci-fi scenarios that we've seen. I can't tell you which one is going to be, but there are, there's a whole range of possibilities here. But um, the next time, being cautious, you have to think to yourself, okay, so what if it's not only your friends that see this photo, uh, but, a, but a machine? Um, and what if the machine could autonomously control another machine, like a drone or something like that, something scary like that? What do you think it would do? And if the answer is nothing, then the only thing you have to worry about is that that machine is not controlled by your enemy. On that serious note, thank you very much.